Good morning. God is good and all the time. God is good indeed. It's good to be with you this morning as we gather together in the house of God to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. My name is Michael Bingham. I'm the pastor here at St. Mark Church. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I welcome all of you to our fellowship this morning. I have a few announcements we want to call your attention to. First of all, from the United Methodist Women. Elizabeth, you have an announcement? Good morning. Good morning. Um, we have about two more weeks. Well, we have two weeks from today when BBS starts. So we, right now we have about 30 kids signed up, so we have lots of room for many more. And if you would like to sign up your child or a friend or if you want to volunteer, we have sign-up sheets in the back, or you can go online, and it's um, in the bulletin where you can sign up. We also have sign-ups for if you would like to teach a Sunday school class for the summer. Um, each year, the VBS has a um, mission project that we, the kids bring money in to buy cows. And one year we did school supplies. But this year we did something that's called the shoe that grows. And um, because there's like 300 million children that do not have shoes to keep their feet safe from diseases and cuts and stuff like that. But these shoes, are supposed to grow five sizes and there should last them about five years. Our goal this year is if we raise $500, that provides 20 shoes. And we thought, why not go a little bit further? If we can raise 800, it would provide 50 pairs of shoes. And um, there's a box in the back. We thought we'd open it up to the congregation and collect for the whole month of July so we could try to get as many pairs of shoes out there as possible. So if you'd like to make a donation, there's a box in the back. And if you write a check, just make it to St. Mark. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'd like to echo and chime in with what Elizabeth just said. The, uh, two years ago this month, I was privileged to be in Africa on a mission trip uh, and I met many children in the country of Malawi, one of the poorest nations on earth. And shoes are a life-saving gift. And many of the children I, I saw and encountered there never, had never owned a pair of shoes. And those few that did have shoes went to great lengths to make those shoes last longer including cutting the toes out of them uh, so that their feet could, could fit through. So uh, th this is a great thing, uh, and so I want to encourage you to give generously to this. Also, the men's club is uh, meeting tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. I uh, have a guest speaker uh, this month. It's the Reverend uh, Gregory Taylor, and uh, Reverend Taylor is the pastor at Morris Brown African Methodist Episcopal Church. He's done great work with young people. Uh, and I've heard exciting things about him. I look forward to meeting him and uh, hearing from him. So I invite you to come out and join us, uh, men of the church, uh, for that meeting. This time I'd like to uh, celebrate life and covenant. Are there birthdays or anniversaries you'd like to celebrate at this time? Any birthdays this past week? Any anniversaries next week? Yes, ma'am. On the July 5th. Yes, ma'am. Happy birthday to you. Yes, ma'am. 39 years old. <laughs> now see, that's the difference between fool, foolishness and wisdom. See, you, no, I'm kidding. Anyone else? Birthdays, anniversaries. All right, let us pray. Gracious and holy God, pour forth your spirit upon us gathered here and help us to hear your word. Help us to be doers of your word. 
Help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus within this world. Send forth your spirit. Enable us to bear faithful witness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our call to worship there. Let's stand and sing. Our hymn of praise is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It's number 64 in the hymnal. Our affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. It's found on page 881 in your hymnal. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Will the children come forward for children's moment?
Thank you. Thank you. As we come out of our time of prayer together, my friends, this has been a very, very difficult week, a heartbreaking week. Um, we've seen scenes of violence uh, before us that uh, are gut-wrenching uh, and, and really leave me virtually speechless, and I'm saying that as one called to preach and, and, and to be able to speak in awful moments, and so um, words almost fail me. But I do know that there is a, a Christian, a godly response uh, to what we've seen this week. In addition uh, to our prayers, we are called as God's people to live out uh, the peace of Christ in our communities. Uh, and so I want to ask uh, all of you uh, pastorally, I'm not going to preach during prayer time, but I do want to ask us uh, to do two things uh, as, as God's people. And I'd just like to ask you, it's on my heart uh, this morning, and so I want to ask you to do two things. First and foremost, I want you to seek out this week uh, someone who is different from you. Uh, perhaps they're on the opposite end of the political spectrum for you, or they belong to the other political party. Uh, perhaps their skin's a different color than yours. Perhaps they're from a different socioeconomic group. And I don't want you to be too overt about it, but just be nice to them. Just... Just be gentle and kind and, and loving in just that, that most basic way, just offering them the peace of God uh, in a kind word or gesture, a hug or a deed. Just do something like that to reach out uh, across that which divides us, okay? I think that's one thing that we as, as God's people, as the church, can do to try to respond to what we've seen this week. I know you know what I'm referring to. I'm referring to Louisiana, Minnesota, and Dallas specifically. But there are many other things. And then the second thing that I want to ask you to do as pastor is I want you to find a man or woman wearing a badge, a man or woman in uniform, who are simply trying to uphold the laws and, and, and be the defenders of justice. You know, that's a pillar of of society. If you don't have social order, you, you don't have a society. And I just want to ask us all to tell a man or woman in uniform that you have their back and that you appreciate their service. Because now understand that we need, we need our men and women in uniform and law enforcement to, to be just and we want the just application of the law and I understand that. But they must know that they have our support. They, we cannot have law enforcement feeling like they are besieged and we are their enemy. For heaven's sake, my brothers and sisters, uh, as Christians, we are called 
to uphold civil authority, to uphold government. You can read Romans 12 yourselves if you want to see the, the scripture text I'm leaning on there. And I just encourage us all to do our part as Christians to begin a healing in our land. We cannot go further down this path that we've begun. We cannot do this. The violence must end. This killing must end. And we need to be the genesis of this, my friends. So please hear me now and, and let's do this this week. Take this up as, as your mantle this week. I have several prayer re requests uh, as well. Also, I'd be remiss not to mention our Sockahatchee crew. We have a 14 or 15 people out this week in two different Sockahatchee camps in Fairfield and also Batesburg. So let's remember them in our prayers. Uh, we have the Lee, the Lee family, uh, Elaine and Stacy Power. Katie and Chrissy Cooter, Linda Sheely, uh, Daniel and Susan Levine, uh, Lawrence Smith, Marie Dabb, Jane Edgerton, Bobby Baxter in the day school, Maureen McCormick, Jerry Bloomberg family, uh, Hannah Warren and her medical team and family, Terry and Mackenzie, uh, Gwinnett, Dawn, David, Jan, and Floyd Putney, our Sorry, I already mentioned that. Uh, Benny Ann Waylett, Pat Connor, Tommy and Lee Warren, the Suit family and Stan Smith, Kitty Duncan, Linda Sheely, Pat and Rex Connor, Mike McNeely, Dave Brown, Bruce Hodges, Dawn McMillan, uh, our youth, our church, and our country. Randy Atkinson, Pauline Johnson, Samantha Glover. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we come before you today and our hearts are broken. Our nation is beset with violence. Racial tension is in the air, Lord. We seem to be more divided than united. Help us to know that true unity comes through faith in Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we are united and that we share in our humanity your image. We are bearers of this image, for we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we as a nation might come to recognize how precious is each and every life. O oh, holy God, help us to be the genesis of peace. Help us to be strong in you. We pray this day for our Sakahatchee teams, for their safety, and that they might be agents of your hope and healing in this world. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for all who grieve. We pray, O oh Lord, this day for those who are feeling a sense of despair or despondency, we pray that they might feel hope in you. O oh, holy God, bless us this day. Help us to be your faithful witnesses. Send us forth into the world as your hands and feet and give us this day the capacity, the joy, the fire to give an answer for the hope that we have in you. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us offer unto God his tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks to you for these, your tithes and offerings. We pray that they would be pleasing in your sight and that you might bless them to do your work in the world. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is Sanctuary. It's number 2164 in the faith we sing. Let us pray in unison the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. Please be seated. And a beautiful morning to each and every one. I bring morning. to you words from a little known and little read book, the book of Jude. For those who want to follow, it's in the New Testament, page 244 in your pew Bible. I'll be reading verse three, and then I will move and do verse 17 through 25. Beloved, while eagerly preparing to write to you about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. In verse 17, but you, beloved, must remember the predictions of the apostles and of our Lord Jesus Christ. For they said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers indulging their own ungodly lust. It is these unworldly people, devout of the, devoid of the spirit, who are causing divisions. But you, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and have mercy on some who are wavering. Save others by snatching them out of the fire and have mercy on, <clears throat> excuse me, and have mercy on still others with fear, hating even the tunic defiled by their bodies. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing, to the only God our savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, brother. Let us pray. O holy God, we've heard your word proclaimed. Help us to be not only hearers of this word, but doers as well. And help us go forth eager to share good news, ready to give an answer in season and out for the hope that we have, which is the risen Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. One of my heroes in the faith is a preacher by the name of Bill Henson. Uh, I got to meet Bill in the last years of his life. He 
had retired by then. Now, Bill, in his final appointment, was uh, the pastor at First United Methodist Church in Houston, Texas. He was really one of the first megachurch pastors uh, in the United States. And Henson was a hero, a tiring figure. If you knew him, you know, you'd, you'd, it's amazing to hear him preach and teach. And I was blessed to get to sit at his feet and, and learn from him. And one of the things he talked about, a story that he told that I got to hear him uh, talk about, was he was... Uh, uh, elected as a, a delegate to general conference more than once, but one time in particular, I think the first time. And for those of you who don't understand what happens at general conference, you know, once every four years, we just did it this year, we, we send delegates and they speak on behalf of the church and they make uh, some very important decisions at times. And really, they meet for a couple of weeks, and uh, for the first week, uh, the work is done in committee, and that's really where a lot of the work is accomplished in these committees. Uh, and, and the delegates are divided up to various committees. And then uh, the, the second week, they come together in what they call the plenary session, and the committees uh, present what they've worked on, and votes are taken, and decisions are made. So uh, Pastor Bill was uh, in a meeting, a committee group meeting, and they were discussing a particular issue. doesn't matter what the issue was. And Bill had the feeling they'd sort of gone astray, that they were wandering in the wilderness a bit. And... Uh, like me, he's a pastor, a man called to preach the word, and so he was trying to bring them back to God and the things of God, and so he simply said, we know in Scripture it says, and he quoted what he felt in his heart was a, an appropriate Scripture for the moment. And when he got done, a man sitting beside him who was also called to preach, an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, said, ah, Bill, we've moved beyond that here. That's not okay. I don't know about you, but I do not want to be beyond Scripture. I don't particularly want to be beyond Jesus. Okay? That's not a good place for us to be. We are God's people. You just heard the Word of God uh, proclaimed. When we were done reading it, we said aloud back and forth to one another, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Amen. So I don't want to be in a place where I feel like I've gone beyond Scripture because if I've gone beyond Scripture, I've gone beyond God. And I don't want to go beyond God either. Now, make no mistake, this is a very, very difficult book. It's a hard book to read. It's an even harder book to understand. And if you accept it as the unvarnished truth, the, the inerrant and infallible word of God, there are some problems that come along with accepting that. And as you get to know me better, we can talk about some of those. I had a seminary professor named Dr. Kirkendall, uh, Dr. K, we referred to him, and he was an Old Testament guy, and I mean that somewhat lovingly. And Dr. K had an assignment that he gave to his second semester Old Testament students that we referred to as the fish. And I want to assure you, if you've got an assignment that gets a nickname from a group of students, then it must be some kind of assignment. And we had to go through, and while I was in seminary in my second semester, we had to start with the crowning of David and go through the genealogy there of the kings, all the kings of the two kingdoms, and we had to align all that by date, and, I, and we had to use as our source this book here in Chronicles and Kings. And let me tell you something. First of all, don't do that, and second of all, you can't do that. And it's really hard to do. And so when I say this is the inerrant and infallible word of God, I know that presents some problems to us, but I will take every one of those problems as I stand upon this, the rock, as the problems I have to accept if I began to say that this thing needs to be updated for the modern era. Or if I try to demythologize what it contains and take out of it those things that we might find offensive as modern people. Because once we begin down that slippery slope, that ends in a place I don't want to be because we will truly move beyond God and beyond the Word of God. And so I stand firmly in a long line of those who preach the word, including people like Bill Henson and Francis Asbury and John Wesley and the Apostle Paul and Jesus himself. Now, that comes back to this insert you have in your bulletin. It's really handy. You can sneeze into it. 
Uh, you can put your gum in it. If you have a young one who needs something to draw on or you're desperately trying to stay awake, it might help you. Or, if God is good to all of us today, someone here might actually write something down and gain something from it later. It might, if nothing else, keep you awake. And on the first line, there's two blanks. And we are now to that point in our sermon. And so the first point that I want to make this morning is that there are false teachers without the Spirit. And I'd like you to fill those blanks in. There are false teachers without the Spirit. There are false teachers without the Spirit. Now, that is not simply Michael Bingham's opinion. This is what Jude has said to us in verses 18 and 19. They, that is the apostles, said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, and do not have the Spirit. Now, if you're wondering when the last times will begin, I will tell you when the last times began. They began when they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross of Calvary, and Scripture makes that clear. Sometimes people refer to last times as if, it, as if that's a future event, but the last times have already begun. They have not yet ended, but they have begun. And so the apostles warned us that in the last times there would be ungodly teachers who would not have the Spirit. Some of them are within our churches. Some of them are outside our churches. Jesus made clear it's not up to us to divide them out of our churches. We want everyone in the church. He used the example of throwing a net into the sea and ca catching a lot of fish. He says it's not up to us to separate the un inedible fish, the fish we don't want to eat, from the edible, the good fish. It's simply our job to catch as many fish as possible. So I'm not asking us to go on a her heretic hunt. In, in different times, in different places in the church's history, we have hunted heretics. And that has invariably ended poorly for all of us. So I'm not inviting us on a heretic hunt. But I am saying to us that there are people we don't need to listen to, and we need to recognize them, and we can rec recognize them because they either have the Spirit or they don't. Now, brothers and sisters, I try, I strive to the best of the ability God has given me to stand before you Sunday in and Sunday out and preach the Word of God to the ability I've been given. And there may come a time when I preach something that is wrong. I preach error up here in this place. Now, if I do that, I invite you to gently and politely, please, correct me. Let's go have a cup of coffee together. Let's open up the Word of God together and prayerfully seek reconciliation here. Perhaps I have been wrong, and if so, I will stand before you and correct that. I will do my best. But perhaps you misunderstood me, or perhaps I'm right and you have a hard truth to learn. But let's discover that together. But one thing I won't do is stand up here and tell you that there is a gospel other than the gospel. That there is a way or a truth or a life that is outside the person of Jesus Christ. Because this is God's command to us. There is but one way. And that is the way. There is but one Savior. And his name is Jesus. So that's the first truth this morning. And we just have to deal with that. That we have around us false teachers and they are without the Spirit. So what do we do about this? Well, thankfully, Jude gives us some ideas about that. By the way, who is Jude? Before I get to my second point, I almost left that out. Jude was a half-brother of Jesus. Jude was a half-brother of Jesus, by which I mean he was Mary's son through Joseph. Jesus was Mary's son through the Holy Spirit because Jesus was born of the Virgin. So when we talk about Jesus' family, you know, there's always this, you know, he was an adopted kid, you know, or however you want to say that. You know, it was a blended family, whatever you want to use up here. But Jude at one point, along with James and the rest of Jesus' family, they thought Jesus was crazy. They tried to take him away gently. They tried to drag him away and kind of you know, hide him because they thought he was crazy. But the risen Christ appeared to Jude, and Jude became a leader in the early church. And he wrote this rarely used, rarely read book right there before the book of Revelation. You know, if I said to you, uh, if I assigned you the task of reading an entire book of Scripture, those of you in the know would know this is a great one to read because in a lot of Bibles it's not even a whole page. 
In fact, really, if you look at the, at the bulletin or my sermon notes, there's really an error there because it says Jude 1, colon, and then the verses. That 1 refers to the chapter. That's, that's an error. There are no chapters in Jude. There's just verses. Don't believe me? Go check it out. There's only one chapter. It's a little bit short book. Along with Philemon, one of the shortest books in the Bible. A great place to go. But Jude writes to us this powerful truth. There are false teachers without the Spirit. And what are we to do about it? Well, he tells us in verses 20 and 21, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. So let's unpack that. We are to build up one another in our most holy faith. See that second line? I'm going through these. We are to build up. We are to pray. We are to wait. By the way, that word wait there in the Greek, it's a little more active. We tend to think of wait as... That's not what we're talking about in the Greek language. This is an eager anticipation, a waiting with expectation. So we are to build up, pray, wait, and, and remain in God's love, which is why I'm not inviting us on a heretic hunt. We are to remain in God's love. So if we have someone who's teaching error within the church, we are to love them because there is always hope through the power of the Holy Spirit they might come out of their error and see the truth. And if they're teaching error outside the church, for heaven's sake, we want them in the church. Churches get all bent out of shape sometimes. Hey, there's sinners here. Yes, there are. I'm looking at them. And you're looking at them too. Remain in God's love. Love me in spite of my sinfulness, and I will love you. Remain in God's love. This is the command. Remain in God's love. Remain in God's love. Our nation this week is being striven apart. You know, we're... we're mm, I mean, words fail me here as I approach talking about this. My brothers and sisters, we must be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. This can begin with us. We live in the holy city. We live in a place where nine people were murdered in a church. First because of the color of their skin and second because they were worshiping the Lord. Struck down because they invited someone different from them into their midst. And what happened here? Did we break out in writing? Did we kill one another? No, because grace is greater. Because Jesus Christ has taught us that the most powerful force in the universe is the force of love. And he proved this to us by stretching out his arms and being nailed to a cross and dying for you and me. What I would like to do more than anything else is talk to you about this salvation. And I stand on the shoulders of Jude as I say this to you. Because that's precisely what Jude says in verse 3 of his book. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. We have been given a gift through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been given a gift that is our faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a gift entrusted to us. The Christian church is always one generation away from extinction. And so we've been entrusted this. And it is time, my brothers and sisters, for us to contend for the faith. Contend. Fight. Work. Struggle. That's what the word contend means. We are called here. And if you're following along on your insert, bottom of the list there, last line, and of course, contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. There are false teachers without spirit, first line. Second line, we build up, pray, wait, and remain in God's love. And then lastly, and of course, contend for the faith. 
In June of 2005, in Kunar province, Afghanistan, there was a small group of Navy SEALs sent on a secret mission. The title of my sermon today is, The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. As a phrase used by the Navy SEALs to motivate one another. This small group of SEALs were four men and a team. They were going out on a reconnaissance mission. For a long time, the exact purpose of the nature of their mission was kept secret, but after the killing of Osama bin Laden, it was, it was released that their actual mission is they were on the trail of Osama bin Laden. They believed they were hunting down UBL, as the military refers to him. And in June of 2005, this small team, four, were, were led by Lieutenant Michael Murphy, now, Murph, as he was referred to uh, before he deployed to Afghanistan, a deployment he took very seriously, went to a childhood friend of his who was a firefighter for the city of New York, a fire department in New York. And he asked his friend for some memento that he could hand out to his fellow SEALs to remind them of the sacrifices of the firefighters of New York, 343 of whom died on 9-11 in the largest rescue operation in human history. And so he was given a patch. His friend served on Engine 53. And so Engine 53 and Ladder 53 serve in Spanish Harlem. They are El Barrio's bravest. And so Murph on that day had that patch on his uniform. And they went in June of 2005 on this secret mission. And there they were discovered by a goat herder. And they knew that what they needed to do was to silence this goat herder, but that would be murder. And they were American service members, and they did not do that sort of thing. And so they released this guy, and he immediately ran to the village and told the Taliban where the Americans were. These events are chronicled in the book and the movie Lone Survivor by Marcus Luttrell, who was awarded the Navy Cross for his heroism that day. After an hours long firefight, three of the SEALs had died. And Luttrell, who was already wounded badly, was caught in an explosion by a rocket-propelled grenade and blasted off a cliff. He blacked out. He woke up laying backwards across a rock. His back had been injured, and he was paralyzed from the waist down. He had a broken leg, a broken nose, shrapnel wounds, and burns. Most of his clothing had been blown off his body. He had a rifle and 13 rounds of ammunition left to him. And as he lay there on that rock, looking up at the sky, he could feel himself dying. He could feel the life seeping out of his body. And as he lay there, in his words, he began to feel sorry for himself. And then something popped into his mind. Luttrell remembered that he was a Navy SEAL. And he said to himself, you know, the only way to break a SEAL is to kill him, and I'm not dead Therefore, I am not broken. And Luttrell reached out beside him, and he found a rock. And he reached up above his head as far as he could reach, and he drew a line upon the earth. And he said to himself, I'm going to crawl off this rock, and I'm going to crawl till my feet are beyond that line. And if I'm still alive when I get there, then I'm going to do something to save myself. He does not know how long it took him, but he knows that he blacked out more than once coming off that rock. And he finally crawled till his feet were beyond that line. And he grabbed a rock and he made another line upon the earth. And he did that over and over again for what is estimated to have been seven miles. Until he came to an Afghan village and the villagers there rescued him, protected him at, at risk to themselves, and turned him over to the Americans who were searching for him. Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who was killed that day, wearing a fire department patch, was awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroism because he, he gave up his position and went out and exposed himself to enemy fire in order to call in reinforcements. I tell you that, my friends, not to glorify or glamorize in any way war, or the nature of war, but to tell you that the only easy day was yesterday. 
to remind you that this is not easy. Jesus Christ died to found this church. Jesus Christ gave his life for you and me. Sixty years ago, in 1956, this church was about a year old. And I want to tell you a little secret. In 1956, it was a lot easier to do church than it is today. What you needed to do was to build a nice building like this one, and I know this isn't the original building, but build a nice building. You get some great music going on, maybe some youth or children's ministries, and hey, bonus if you get a really good-looking preacher. Why y'all laughing? <laughs> you do these things, and people show up. People come. Thirty years later, 1986, you know what? Same thing held true, largely. Now, if you were an astute observer, what you might have noticed in 1986 versus 1956 in those 30 years is that if you did the exact same things in 1986 that you did in 56. Your, your harvest from that effort would be diminished noticeably. Most people ignored that at the time, but it was already true. And just to be clear here, if you go back 30 years further to 1926, it was even easier to do church. Now, 60 years after the founding of this church, let me tell you a secret. People are not beating down those doors to get in here. They are not magically going to appear. It is hard to do church today. It is harder than it's ever been in our nation's history to be a Christian. And not to sound like I'm being self-serving or whining to you, it's harder to be a minister than it's ever been in our nation's history. The only easy day was yesterday. We must adapt and overcome this problem that is before us because our nation is dying. Our nation is going to hell. I said that the first week I was here. And if you have a problem with me saying our nation is going to hell, then you have a hell of a problem. And I mean that. I mean that biblically and theologically. I mean that biblically and theologically. If you go to a CrossFit workout place on Memorial Day somewhere near here, you may be introduced to an exercise called the MRF. It's named for Lieutenant Michael Murphy. It was one of his favorite exercises that he did on a regular basis. You will be invited for time to run one mile as fast as you can, to do 100 pull-ups, to do 200 push-ups, to do 300 squats, and then to run one more mile all for time. Oh, and by the way, you will be invited, as Murphy did, to wear body armor, a vest that weighs between 80 and 20 pounds. That was one of the daily exercises that Lieutenant Michael Murphy did so that he could be a cutting-edge warrior for this nation. He did it gladly, and he enjoyed it, which is a little weird. What are you doing to be a warrior for Jesus Christ? If it's harder today to be a Christian than it's ever been before, then let me assure you, simply coming to church on Sunday and plopping down in a pew is not enough. We must contend for the faith. We must fight. We must get up and wrestle and struggle with this world around us so that we can become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. What are you doing to be built up in this faith that we have? Are we praying every day? Are we waiting eagerly, expectantly for the Lord? Are we remaining in God's love? These are the things that we are called to do. The spiritual exercises that we must do to be all that we can be for Jesus Christ because more than anything else, the reason our churches are dying is because we don't have Christians within them that are dedicated enough to do what it takes. I thank God for warriors like Michael Murphy and Marcus Luttrell who give of themselves and have given so much for us. So my friends, we must become more like them we must model ourselves after that. So today, if you go to Engine 53's house in Spanish Harlem, you will see there a statue of Lieutenant Michael Murphy. On their patch today, in addition to saying El Barrio's bravest, there's a simply the phrase, Murph. And every day, as the firefighters go by that statue, they reach out and touch it. They reach out and touch it. 
They know what he did for them. They know what they do for him. As you pass the cross of Jesus Christ today, reach out and touch him. Know that he died for you and that he calls you to be all that you can be so that we can make a difference in this world because the only easy day was yesterday. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we are here today, help us to be your servants. Help us to be faithful. Help us to contend for this faith. Help us to give of ourselves fully so that we might be your servants. We pray that you would bless us as your servants. Bless us to be your faithful witnesses and send us forth eager to share good news. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Receive now this benediction.
Go out and serve your God and your neighbor and all that you do. And may the blessing of Almighty God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you now and evermore until we meet again. Amen.